He was too scared to tell his fiance the truth, too scared of being rejected. So what did he do? He decides to murder his entire family. Hey friends, in this week's case, we're gonna be talking about a man named Brett Ryan. And if you haven't heard of him before, then this is gonna be a really good story. Brett Ryan grew up in Toronto, Canada, and he was described to be someone who was very friendly, very easygoing, very polite, and he seemed to be able to make friends very easily wherever he went. He grew up in a pretty normal and seemingly happy household with two parents and three brothers. Brett was also the third of four brothers. Brett's friends described Brett's family as a pretty introverted family, but described Brett to be somebody who was very outgoing and he was definitely the most outgoing one of the bunch. But even though Brett seemed to be very happy and very outgoing on the outside, Brett on the inside struggled with bouts of depression and had this unhealthy habit of bottling things up on the inside. So he would never tell his family or his friends or any of his loved ones when he was dealing with something particularly difficult in his life. He very much preferred to keep everything inside. He he definitely had a lot of struggles, but on the outside really preferred to present this very happy, outgoing, good guy image. And so that's what a lot of people presumed him to be. Everybody who knew him thought that he was just a really good person. He volunteered at the Sick Children's Hospital. He also refereed Little League games at the local community centers. And he was good looking, he was generous, and on the outside, it seems like he really just had his shit together. After finishing high school, Brett did enroll into the University of Toronto, but shortly due to personal matters that he didn't really discuss with people, he did drop out. After dropping out of university, Brett did decide to take a summer job as a house painter. He did this because he wanted to make some cash on the side while he was figuring out his life, but eventually he did make this his full-time job and he would go from job to job with a paintbrush and a wide smile. He seemed pretty content with that. I can't stress enough just how many people thought that Brett was just this all around good guy, super friendly, super polite, super all together. But really there was a much darker side to Brett than anyone could have ever imagined. So in 2007, and I think this was after Brett had already dropped out of university, he was living in his family home in Conference Boulevard in Toronto, Canada. And he was also in quite a bit of debt, about $60,000 worth of debt. I'm not 100% certain where all of this debt came from, but documents later filed with the Parole Board of Canada did suggest that Brett had accumulated this debt through unhealthy intimate relationships. I'm not sure what the story is there, but that was kind of what I had gathered from my research. And rather than admit to the fact that he was struggling, Brett decided that he needed to patch over his problems with a ton of cash. The idea that made the most sense to him in terms of getting a ton of cash very quickly was to rob a bank. Not the most creative idea, but there you go. So on October 20th of 2007, Brett Ryan would go on to rob his first bank. The first bank that Brett ever robbed was the CIBC on 371 Old Kingston Road, which was only an eight minute drive from his home. During his very first robbery, and yes, I did say first because there's gonna be multiple robberies that he would carry out. During his first one ever, he wrapped his entire face in bandages, hung his left arm in a sling, and shuffled into the branch of the bank holding a stack of papers. He then approaches the counter where the teller is and goes up to her, slides her a note that indicates that he's holding a gun and that she needs to give him $2,000 or else. And the teller being terrified for their life as any sane person would be, complies and gives him the money. Although instead of the $2,000 that he had demanded, he only received $1,115. But he managed to get out of the bank and didn't get caught. So after his very first robbery, after not getting caught, he was hooked. Over the next eight months, Brett would go on to rob 12 more banks along the 401 and around his house and even robbed his home branch. Throughout all of these robberies, I believe he managed to steal about $28,000. And you're probably wondering, how the hell did this guy manage to rob 12 banks without getting arrested? Or well, he did get arrested, he just didn't get arrested before these 12. The reason he was so successful in getting away with these robberies is because he had never been arrested before. So since he had never been arrested before, he didn't have fingerprints in the system, and without fingerprints in the system, it's harder to find the right guy. Brett also really enjoyed the theatrics of his crimes. After his second robbery, he decided that it was time to up his game 
and invest in a high quality costume or disguise. This led him to purchasing a high quality beard that he would glue on and this in turn would end up earning him the nickname of the bearded bandit. His disguise would also include a Gilligan hat, glasses, a plaid shirt, and a dark jacket. Brad's luck eventually did run out and during one of his heists, police managed to spot his truck in one of the external cameras and they ended up tracking him home. By the time that Brad was hitting his very last bank, which is the TD Canada Trust at 3115 Kingston Road, police had already been watching him for about two weeks. Brad must have suspected that something was up as he went into the bank and then quickly turned around and tried to get out. But when he got out of the bank, he was surprised to find the police outside waiting for him. So Brad, having been caught by the police, decided to plead guilty and he spent seven months in custody while awaiting his trial. The trial took place in January of 2009 and during this trial, several of Brett's friends decided to write a letter of support. They wrote letters detailing his generosity, saying how good of a guy he was, and basically just saying that he didn't deserve to spend more time in jail. And during his trial, Brett seemed to be genuinely remorseful of his actions. He acknowledged the pain and the impact that his actions had on his family. And when addressing the court, he just said that he was super sorry for everything that had happened and for all the trauma that he had caused everybody. Again, that he was just really sorry. He also said that despite his personal issues, he shouldn't have done this and it was very selfish of him. Justice Paul Robertson, who was the judge presiding over his case at that time, was moved Moved by Brett's statements. And this would lead to Judge Robertson citing Brett's stellar background and basically just saying that his actions, you know, with the robberies were completely out of his character. Brett was sentenced to five years in prison, but with time served and early parole, he was back at home with his family in late 2010, ready to start fresh. But starting fresh outside of prison walls was harder than Brett thought it would be. The world in late 2010 was a harsher one than Brett remembered it to be. He could no longer avoid his debt and ended up filing for bankruptcy and finding work was proving to be incredibly difficult, especially since employers or potential employers would Google him and find out that he was the bearded bandit and not want to hire him. This led Brett to trying to resume his house painting business, but it didn't go well because clients would find out about his criminal past and they wouldn't want him in his house, uh, which is kind of understandable to be honest. Basically, he was just really struggling to find work and the world just kind of sucked for him at that point. At this point in time, Brett was soon approaching 30 and he was a struggling bankrupt ex-con with high school education and absolutely no prospects. It wasn't looking very good for him to be honest. And due to his situation and his finances, Brett had to live at home with his parents. So with his dad Bill and his mother Sue and I think two of his brothers. So after everything that had happened with Brett, you know, all the crimes, the robberies, whatever, people in Brett's family's neighborhood started to really gossip about Brett and his family, which really bothered Sue and Bill, the parents. So they ended up selling their large home and buying a small post-war bungalow in Lawndale Road, and this is in Scarborough. It wasn't far from their original home, but they were pretty happy to be out of their old neighborhood and to be away from gossipy people. And Lawndale proved to be a pretty nice place for them to settle because it was quiet and it was calm. And after having moved to Lawndale, Brett did decide to knuckle down and focus on taking steps to improve his life. He began to work low paying jobs and with help from his parents, he decided to re-enroll into the University of Toronto to study biophysics. And during this time, he also decided to see a psychologist who told him that in order to avoid getting himself into trouble again, he needed to be more open with the people that he loved about his personal issues and to ask for help where needed. To give him some credit, he did really seem to make a good effort to try to connect with his family and his friends and to be more open about the things that he was struggling with. In September of 2011, a friend of Brett's decided to set him up on a blind date. And this is when he meets an athletic and beautiful and blonde physiotherapist named Kristen Baxter. For their first date, they met at the corner of York and Queens Quay near Kristen's waterfront condo. And to Brett, Kristen was this amazing, perfect girl. She had a nice job, she had a nice home, 
home and she was basically living the life that Brett wanted for himself. Brett and Kristen got on pretty well. Kristen enjoyed a lot of the same things that Brett did. She enjoyed traveling, hiking. She had this really cute like poodle mixed dog. And she was also super friendly and bubbly. So her personality matched Brett's quite well. And together they just seemed like the perfect couple. And while dating Kristen, Brett did come clean to Kristen about his criminal past, but this didn't seem to stop her from falling in love with him. So things really did seem to improve for Brett in his life. And in January of 2013, Brett decided to move into Kristen's condo. This was definitely a dramatic change from his family's suburban bungalow, and he loved it. I mean, Kristen lived in this glassy downtown tower. It was a smallish condo, about 549 square feet, but it had a beautiful view of the lakes beyond Toronto Islands. Brett often barbecued on the roof of the condo. He often swam in the indoor and outdoor pool. The couple also traveled often. They often went to tropical locations. So they were living a pretty nice life together. And then about a year after moving in with Kristen, Brett's father did unfortunately pass away. During this time, Brett did step in to help take care of his mom, help his mom take care of administrative tasks that his dad used to handle, and also help around the house for extra cash. So he was basically working around the house, renovating the house, and his mom was giving him some money for that. Apparently, Brett really needed the money, especially since he had just recently proposed to Kristen. He had purchased her a ring that was a princess cut diamond ring with a halo of smaller diamonds. I'm not exactly sure where he got the money from because I thought this guy was broke. I mean, I know he's working, but he was working low paying jobs, but maybe he wasn't paying rent and he saved money. I don't know. But anyways, I thought rings were pretty expensive. Like, aren't they like on average $3,000 to $5,000? I don't know. I'm not engaged. I've never been proposed to, so I don't know how much rings cost, but I think they're pretty expensive. Anyways, his finances were basically flopping again and he was getting himself into a lot of financial trouble. Then in 2015, Brett ended up dropping out of university, but he didn't tell his family and he didn't tell Kristen, his fiance. So for a while, he actually pretended like he was going to university still and still pursuing his degree when really he wasn't anymore. However, Brett did catch a lucky break in the spring of 2016 when he landed a job in a Toronto tech firm. It finally seemed like Brett would be able to break away from his low paying jobs and finally start to earn some more income. He was super, super happy about this. Like, come on guys, it was really hard for him to find work. It was really difficult. So he was thrilled, he celebrated with his family and his fiance. But unfortunately, Brett's luck was pretty short lived. Within days of hiring him, his his company found out that he was the bearded bandit and they quickly rescinded the offer. So Brett was basically back to square one again. And embarrassed and not wanting to tell his family and fiance about this, he decided that it would just be better for them to continue thinking that he had a job. So he told them that he worked from home and that this was a remote role. And every day he would wake up and he would get ready for work. He would go to his desk and he would pretend to work an imaginary job basically. And he did this for a while, like a year or a few years. And in the midst of all of these lies that he was spinning, he and Kristen were also planning their wedding for September 16th of 2016. So they had planned to get married at Ancaster Mill, which is a Rustic Creekside venue near a town called Hamilton. And this would be coming with a $100 plated service per person fee. Brett was also planning to throw a bachelor party with some of his friends in August. And it was all very bougie and definitely out of his budget. The couple were also planning to move out of their condo and into a house after the wedding. And they had already hired a realtor and they were looking at houses. People really had no idea what was going on with Brett and his finances. His mom honestly thought that Brett had turned his life completely around and she was often bragging to neighbors about his degree, about his university, about his good job and his beautiful fiance and their upcoming wedding. He was literally bamboozling everyone. And honestly, it must have been incredibly exhausting to have to wake up every day as Brett to live this fake life. I don't know how he did it and honestly, I'm a little bit impressed that he managed to keep it up for that long. Any 
anywho, with all of these financial demands coming up, you know, like the wedding, the house, the bachelor party, Brett heavily started to depend on his mother financially. He was pressing her for more work around the house to earn extra cash. I'm not sure how much she was paying him to do chores or to do tasks around the house or to renovate the house, whatever he was doing. But yeah, she was basically like his main source of income and she really did try to do what she could for him. But even with his mom's help, his financial situation was really, really bad. It got so bad that Brett finally had to confess to his mother that he was living this whole lie. He told her about the situation with his university, you know, how he didn't actually complete his university studies and actually doesn't have a degree and that he's been working a fake imaginary job. So yeah, he told her like everything and he was expecting her to be like, oh honey, don't worry, I've got you, I'll give you some money, I'll take care of you, whatever, you know, he was expecting her to be all in, like, let's fix this. But her reaction, understandably, it, her reaction was actually the total opposite of what he was expecting. Brett was totally shocked when his mom turned to him and was like, you know what, you gotta tell Kristen the truth or I'm not helping you anymore. Sue, Brett's mother, also said that if he refused to tell Kristen the truth, then she would take it upon herself to tell Kristen the truth herself. Pretty reasonable if you ask me, but for Brett, it was apparently like the worst possible scenario. He was basically worried that if Kristen found out about everything, she would leave him and then he'd be forced to move back to Lawndale to live with his mom and his brothers. You know, in his mind, he was too close to achieving his dream life that that mm, no, he was absolutely not gonna let his mother ruin this for him. So what does Brett decide to do? Does he decide to come clean, and to start living within his means, or to do something that's a lot more productive in his life? Of course not. He decides it'd be so much easier to kill his mother because obviously that'll just solve everything, right? So next steps. Brett decides he needs a weapon. Tricky though, because the conditions of his last sentencing, yeah, his last sentencing, you know, when he was caught for robbing 12 banks. Well, the condition of that was that he would never be able to acquire any firearms. So because he can't purchase a gun, he decides to purchase a crossbow, which apparently you can just purchase without a license. As long as you're 18, yeah, you can just get one. So Brett chooses a Barnett Recruit Youth 30, which happens to be the lightest and cheapest crossbow available in Canada and is also designed to be used for teenage hunters. This crossbow shoots at 140 feet per second and only costs around $288 on Amazon. But since Brett didn't want to leave any incriminating evidence behind on his purchase, he decided to purchase it second hand. In the days after Brett's mother's ultimatum, Brett still went to the house and still worked on the renovation projects at his mom's home. And during one of those trips, he brings his crossbow and he hides it in a shelf in his garage. And the reason he put it there was because they were renovating the house and the garage contained a lot of like the renovation tools and materials. So everything was a mess in there. He figured no one would ever go in there and poke around. So he stashed it in there just waiting for the right day to kill his mother. And the right day came on August 25th of 2016. The couple woke up that morning with Kristen getting ready for her physiotherapy practice and with Brett getting ready for his imaginary job. Kristen left for work about 7.30 a.m. in the morning that day. And as soon as Kristen left, Brett got to work to building a device that he had hoped to be able to use as an alibi if he was ever accused of committing the crimes that he was about to go and commit. First, he opened his laptop and propped it against a wall with two five pound weights. Then he duct taped a wooden spoon to a black cylindrical oscillating fan. And then he placed it so that the tip of the spoon would line up with the laptop's enter key. And then he plugged the cord into a digital timer, like you know, the ones used for Christmas lights. So that when the timer activated, the fan would turn on and the spoon would click on a cursor that was hovering over an icon that would open YouTube. Next, he also took two portable fans, plugged them in into a digital timer, and then he screwed them onto a wooden board, which he then placed on top of the kitchen counter. He then taped styluses to the casings of the fans. After that, Brett then screwed a smartphone and a tablet to a wooden board so that the screens of the tablet and the smartphone would face the fans. And the reason for this is so that when the timer sets off, the fans would then turn 
turn and the styluses would tap onto the screen of the tablet and the smartphone and each would then send out a pre-typed out message. One of those messages was going to a friend thanking them about a real estate tip and then the other one was about a home repair. These timers were set to go off at various times in the afternoon and the devices were set in a way that they wouldn't go to sleep while he was away. Brett designed all of this to have like a digital trace so that if he was ever accused of anything he could just say to the police like no I was just at home watching YouTube and sending emails. So it was really like the perfect digital age alibi. I mean I gotta admit it's not a horrible plan. It's just a real shame that instead of putting all of this like creative planning energy or like his brain energy into doing something that would be productive or would help to improve his life he decides to rob banks and then kill his family. Anyways despite the super hot weather that day Brett decides to put on two pairs of jeans. I really don't know why he decided to wear two pairs of jeans. That just sounds really uncomfortable, but he did what he did. He then also packed a gym bag, and in that gym bag he put in spare clothing, a wig, a galleon hat, glasses, and basically his old familiar disguise from his bank robbery days. And he realized that in order to make this work, he would have to leave his condo without being noticed. And the only way to do this would mean he would have to go down 14 flights of stairs and through a back alley, which he did. And so he was able to get out of his condo without being seen by the cameras and by the condo staff. He then would arrive at his family's home at about 10 a.m. in the morning. When he did, his mom was there. She was quite surprised to find him there. She wasn't really expecting him to come over because it was a work day. He arrives at the home and his mom's like, hey, what's up, what you doing? Brett then decides that he would try to convince his mom again to see his perspective on things and to basically help bail him out of the situation that he was in. But his mom, remaining firm, held her ground and was like, no, like as I said, if you're not gonna be honest with your future wife, then I'm gonna have to be honest for you. This obviously upset Brett even more, so there's back and forth, the argument gets very heated. At some point, Sue, Brett's mother, I guess feels threatened enough that she decides to call Chris, Brett's older brother, and say like, Chris, I need you to come here and handle the situation because I'm fighting with your brother. I imagine it must have been a pretty heated and scary argument because if you you have to call your other son to come and help you de-escalate an argument with another son of yours, then you must have felt threatened in some sense or form. So Chris is on his way and Brett's like, oh shit, things are getting out of hand and nothing is going the way I had planned. So he decides to walk over to the garage, you know, where the crossbow is. And Sue, not knowing that there's a crossbow in there, is like, oh, I'm gonna follow my son. And the distance from the house to the garage didn't really give Brett that much time to to set up the crossbow. So what he does is he grabs the broadhead bolt and stabs his mother in the cheek and in her ear. He then wrestles her to the ground in the garage and takes a piece of yellow nylon rope and strangles her to death. He literally stabbed and strangled his own mother in her own home. And why? Because she literally told him to grow up and stop lying to his fiance about having a degree, about having a job, and to be honest with her about his like life situation. All of which are pretty big things to be lying about. So now that he's got his mother out of the way, Brett starts preparing the crossbow for his brother because he remembers that his brother is coming and he's in deep shit because he just killed his mom. He sets it up with no issues and then waits in the garage for Chris to arrive. Shortly after that, Chris reaches the house, he walks into the garage and this is when Brett creeps up behind him at a very close range shoots this crossbow into his brother's neck from behind. His brother did die of this immediately. And after this, there's just a ton of blood everywhere and you know, the garage floor is just covered in sawdust and blood. Brett decides he needs to grab Chris's body and he needs to like hide Chris's body and his mom's body. So he grabs Chris's body, stacks it up on top of his mom's body and hides their bodies behind a like stack of wood piles. And then he just throws a tarp over them. And after after cleaning, Brett is about to change into his spare clothes that he had brought with him from his condo when he hears his younger brother AJ arriving to the house. So now he's like, oh crap, everything's just gone to shit. I'm too far deep into this and I basically just need to kill AJ now too. Brett exits the garage 
and meets his younger brother AJ on like the driveway walkway to the back door and Brett has a crossbow into his hand and as he approaches AJ he stabs his younger brother AJ in the neck AJ just collapses onto the driveway okay so now things are starting to get like a lot crazier because it turns out that Brett's third brother Leyland was also home and napping upstairs but due to all the commotion going on downstairs he wakes up and he's like I'm gonna go check out like what is going Going on downstairs so he comes downstairs and sees his younger brother AJ bleeding out on the driveway so as any sane person would he then decides to like run back into the house to try to call 911 and Brett spots his brother doing this so then he dashes into the house attacks him so things are getting super chaotic now two brothers are fighting throughout the house they're breaking furniture they fought through like a hallway two bedrooms broke a table broke lamps Everything is just a mess. And Brett's also covered in his family's blood. Leyland is also covered in blood as well because he sustained a head injury. So there's blood on like the walls, the floors, the ceilings. It just looks like a insane murder house at this point. Meanwhile, as all of this is going on inside, AJ, poor AJ, he's still alive. He, you know, still bleeding from his neck, tries to crawl out onto the driveway near the road so that he can possibly maybe get help. But he only makes it as far as the front of the house when Leyland finally escapes from inside the house and runs outside to find AJ like still alive but bleeding out on the driveway and Brett like a crazy person starts dashing out of the house after Leyland and Leyland sees this and starts to run quickly across the street to the neighbors to try to get help. Leyland ends up making it over to the neighbor's house and he starts hammering on the door and luckily the neighbors are home so they open the door and he was like look please help me please call 911 my brother's out there on the driveway bleeding out to death just please call the police make sure they come and as soon as he finishes relaying that message to the neighbors he just collapses at this point brett's outside he sees everything that's going on he's like fuck i'm pretty much screwed he just walks his butt right back into his house goes to the fridge grabs a bottle of water and then comes out and sits on the porch step and just calmly sits there waiting for the police to arrive so police eventually arrive and at that point aj is still alive but by the time the paramedics get there aj unfortunately passes away and brett still calmly sipping on his water and sitting on the porch turns to police and quote says i should have driven him to the hospital the guys in the garage are dead crossbow to the head it was me so yeah police end up taking brett away and he's been arrested after brett was apprehended the police officials did go over to kristen's condo and they did find the device that brett had set up for his alibi and according to authorities the devices were built pretty decently and would have worked totally fine if they hadn't basically taken it apart interestingly enough the reports that the authorities had put together about these devices contradict predicted Brett's statement. Brett had told prosecutors that he had a change of heart after assembling the alibi devices and that he hadn't activated them prior to leaving the house because he was only hoping to have a discussion with his mom, not to kill his mother. But this wasn't true because he had activated them before leaving the house and that was proven by the authorities when they got there. So for his trial, Brett did hire a defense attorney named John Rosen and John Rosen was known in Canada to be Mr. Murder. And John Rosen was given the nickname Mr. Murder because he had a long track record of defending murderers, including the infamous Paul Bernardo, who was known to be Canada's very famous serial killer and uh, other things, like serial rape. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word on YouTube, but yeah. Brett was convicted of second degree murder for the death of his mother. During the trial, he stated that during the argument, he didn't have any intentions to murder her, but he only went to get the crossbow to like confront her, um, not to kill her. However, he did plead guilty to first degree murder for Chris because he admitted that he did hide and wait for Chris to come to the garage and then murdered Chris. He also pled guilty to the second degree murder murder of AJ. He said that he really didn't mean to murder AJ. Well, he didn't plan to murder AJ. He never even expected his younger brother to show up to the house. And after the sentencing, Brett cheerfully addressed the court. And what he said in this court hearing was so similar to what he said during his first sentencing when he like did all those robberies. He basically said he was like super sick with grief and very sorry for what happened and that he's going to, from here on out, 
make the most of every opportunity that he's given to really just make the best out of his life. Yeah, again, he's really sorry for murdering his family. Just sounds like a load of bullshit to be honest. Brett then received concurrent life sentences for each of the murders, plus 10 years for the attempted murder of Leyland, his older brother. However, he's going to be eligible for parole in 2041. And at this point, I think he'll be about 60 years old. The judge who is presiding over his case, I believe his name is Justice John McMahon. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. The judge expressed admiration for Brett's presentation in court. So judge basically determined that Brett was a good man who had just done horrible things, but that he was really, really sorry for what he did. So he wasn't a bad guy. Like what? This sentencing really pisses me off. I guess Brett is just a really presentable guy because during the trial following his arrest for the robberies, the judge for that trial also said a very similar thing. I really don't know what it is. Maybe it's just his like friendly, innocent looking demeanor. The judge for the murder trial even stated that Brett was a victim of this tragedy. A victim? Like how is he a victim? Like I really don't understand it. Someone who chooses to take away the lives of others, especially like your own family, you can't be deemed as a good person or a victim. Like you are not a victim here. You are not a good person. I don't care what's going on in your personal life, there is no excuse for that. And even if there was an excuse, murdering your family because your mom was going to tell your fiance that you've been lying to her about your entire life is definitely not an acceptable one. Brett, to me, seems like an egotistical and selfish man. He could have done so many things to improve his life and to make something of himself, but he chose to be a monster. He chose to kill his family and he chose to lie to everybody. The people I feel bad for are his family. I mean, his dead mother and his two dead brothers. And most of all, I feel so bad for Leyland. He's the sole survivor of his brother's attacks and he's been traumatized for basically the rest of his life by having to see his entire family be slaughtered by his brother. During the trial, Leyland did say that his whole life has now been shattered by this trauma and that he suffers from severe anxiety. He struggles to leave his own home, he struggles to sleep or to focus on things, and he says that he's often haunted by the image of his younger brother AJ bleeding out on the driveway. I find it crazy that the evil man who created this trauma and committed these murders has the possibility of getting out on parole in 2041. And I find it just beyond upsetting that the judge who presided over this case had the audacity to state that Brett was a good man or even a victim in this tragedy. He is far from a good man and he is far from a victim. Anyways, that is the end of the case. I was super pissed about how this ended and I honestly do believe that Brett Ryan deserves to spend the rest of his life in jail. I truly hope he doesn't get out on parole and that he rots in jail. Sorry for that little rant, but as always, Thank you so much for joining me. And if you like this content, please click like and subscribe because it really does help. And I hope to see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.